Now also if we take individualism seriously, uh, we can certainly talk about the political institutions here, but if we take individualism seriously, that's going to have economic institutions uh, or economic implications, for example, and what we also find is a dramatic increase in capitalist institutions, uh, uh, free market institutions. We have a breakdown of the feudal economic structure that again had been around for, for a great deal of time. Rather than only the king being allowed to own property and perhaps a few nobles being able to own property, perhaps maybe a few freeholders here and there. Property rights are extended to everybody. Everybody in principle can own property rights. Rather than the career path that one follows being dictated by one's place in a class structure. If you're born a woman, then here is what your career path is going to be. If you're born the son of the duke, well, here's what your career path is going to be. If your father is a tinsmith or a, or, or a haberdasher, right, or, or a cooper, here's what your career path is going to be. It's all set out uh, and so forth. Instead, what we have is individuals being free to make their own individual rational choices about what they want to do with their lives and so forth. So we have liberty rights in the economic sphere, we have property rights in the, in the economic sphere, and people are increasingly seen as free agents, free individuals, free to enter into whatever sorts of contractual arrangements they want with other people as well. And so by the time we get to the late 1700s, uh, uh, we find capitalistic free market institutions coming to dominate the, uh, the, the world. And uh, just as in 1776, the American Revolution uh, was a primarily a political revolution, certainly had a number of economic implications as well. But also in 1776, the, the first kind of modern uh, uh, treatise on capitalist free market institutions, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, is published. Uh, 1776 then is a, a banner year here. And then uh, the implication of that is that capitalist institutions are much more productive uh, if you have people choosing their own careers and you have contract and property rights and so forth. We should have societies that are uh, much wealthier uh, than traditional feudal societies. Uh, and so what we have then, and why I'm calling this as an enlightened envisionment, if, if we think of the intellectuals of the 1700s who are noticing the trend toward political liberalism, the trend toward economic capitalism, the industrial revolution, the various uh, revolutions in medicine and uh, science more broadly speaking, that all of these revolutionary things are, are coming into place and we can trace that back to some philosophical revolutions that had occurred in the 1600s. That vision allows us then to project out what's going to happen over the course of the next century or so and any number of of, uh, of predictors, right, in the eight, among the 18th century intellectuals will argue very optimistically that human beings, their future, right, is going to be a future of progress, right, that we have finally figured out a set of philosophical principles that when institutionalized will make people free and that freedom will be more progressive. People will be wealthier. People will have more material goods. Poverty will not be a natural and inescapable amount of life. People will live longer and they will live uh, health, uh, more healthily and, and, and relatively more pain-free. That progress is the natural birthright of, of, of humankind. There is not a, a human problem that can't be solved with the application of reason and all of reason's uh, institutions. And so we can think progressively, we can think in terms of the pursuit of happiness being the natural uh, birthright. We can think of freedom, health, uh, and ultimately uh, wisdom and, uh, and so forth as the natural lot of man. All right, now this is the enlightenment vision as I'm calling it. Uh, and it is a way of developing uh, in flowchart form how this set of modern philosophical themes uh, is expected to develop historically. This is a kind of an abstract timeless uh, table uh, characterizing some abstract themes here. If we operationalize it uh, politically, uh, economically, and in terms of scientific and technological institution, if we operationalize it and make it an actual working part of the machinery of culture, the argument is that this is what is going to play out. And so we have a very optimistic, a very good news story uh, about the modern world. Now, what does all of this have to do with postmodernism? 